everyone and welcome to my last Z690 motherboard preview before the Alder Lake CPUs finally launch this week. And today I'm going to talk about these two motherboards from MSI. So the Z690 Carbon, uh, which is a bit of a premium mid-range board, and the Z690 Unify, which is a high-end board with a focus on quality components and overclocking, but then without any of the unnecessary extras that you will find on those crazy expensive flagship models. Now performance is still under NDA, so I can't really talk about that today, but I'm going to go over some of the features that these motherboards have to offer and also compare them to the other 10 motherboards from ASUS and Gigabyte that I talked about in my last two videos. So let's begin. This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime Series power supplies. These top quality power supplies are very efficient, they're whisper quiet, extremely reliable and my go-to choice for most of my test rigs and builds around here. And to make the deal even sweeter, Seasonic wraps it all up in a cozy 12 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. So I'm going to start with the cheapest of the two, which is the Z690 Carbon Wi-Fi. And I probably shouldn't call it cheap because it will cost you around $400 in the US or 440 euros here in the Netherlands, which is far from cheap. When it comes to design, it is pretty impressive and visually pleasing. It is chunky and sturdy. It has a black PCB, decent sized heat sinks, a large IO cover, and if you're into that, it offers plenty of RGB as well. It does support a DDR5 memory only, so you will have to get DDR5 RAM for this motherboard. You cannot just use your old DDR4 modules, and it can fit a total of five M2 SSDs on the board itself. Four of those M2 slots supports Gen 4 SSDs, and the fifth one is a Gen 3 slot. And as you can see, all five of them have cooling on the top, but only the first one has cooling on the bottom. Now, this generally isn't a big deal because the only part of an SSD that actually needs cooling is the controller, and the controller usually sits on top. So if you like a lot of storage, this motherboard might be an interesting choice for you. Now they also added the little sliding latches instead of the tiny screws to install the SSDs, but unfortunately they only added it to three out of five slots, which is kind of weird. Now I don't think it's a cost saving measure and I just fail to kind of see the logic behind that. So if you want to use more than three SSDs, you will still need to deal with those annoying little screws after all. But while none of the M2 slots supports Gen 5 SSDs, this board does come with two Gen 5 PCIe slots, which means that by the time Gen 5 SSDs become a thing, you could just buy a Gen 5 add-in card and add new SSDs that way. And this is where I think this carbon motherboard stands out from some of its competitors. So most of the motherboards that are in this price range will not have that second Gen 5 expansion slot. So Gigabyte adds it on the Tachyon and up, which should start at $550. And ASUS offers this feature from the Hero motherboard and up, so from that $600 price point. But the Gen 5 SSD discussion is a bit of a tricky one, and it is really hard to say whether it will be valuable to you or not. So first of all, Gen 5 SSDs don't really exist, and for many users, even Gen 4 SSDs are barely worth the extra investment over the Gen 3 models. Now, most people just don't benefit from that extra speed. And now that might change when Microsoft Direct Storage finally comes out, because that would finally bring us some real palpable benefits from really fast SSDs, but keep in mind, this is in the future. None of this is here quite yet, nor it has a set release date. And the second thing here is the pure architecture of Alder Lake CPUs. So they only offer 16 Gen 5 lanes in total, and typically all of those lanes will be dedicated to your GPU through the first expansion slot. But if you decide to use a Gen 5 SSD, either through the onboard M2 slot or with the adding card that is plugged into the second expansion slot, it doesn't really matter how, the SSD will use half of those lanes and leave the other half, so only eight lanes for your GPU, and that will limit your GPU's bandwidth. And right now, it is pretty much hard to say how much of a difference that will make, but so far, if you run your GPU in the by eight instead of the by 16 slot, it made only about 1% of an FPS difference in game. So it is likely that if you expect to really benefit from a Gen 5 SSD, running your GPU in the by eight mode probably isn't going to matter 
that much. But it is definitely something to consider if you mostly play games and then especially those games where every frame counts. So you really need to decide here for yourself what fits you best and what would you like more. But in most other aspects, Carbon offers a pretty typical mid-range package. There's eight fan headers, two addressable RGB headers, a single RGB header, two internal USB 2 ports, a single USB 3 port and a 10 gigabit USB Type-C header for the Type-C port on your case. Now, ideally, this should have been a 20 gigabit port for this price. You get a total of 10 USB ports, uh, five of them are 10 gigabit ones, and you get a single 20 gigabit Type-C port in the back. There's a 2.5 gigabit LAN, Wi-Fi 6E, and you get 7.1 audio plus an optical out from a very decent ALC 4080 audio chip. Now, all these things are pretty fine, but none of it really stands out from the competition or actually even from some of the cheaper boards on the market. So the Aorus Pro or the MSI Tomahawk, for example, will offer most of these basic features, but will cost you considerably less. The Carbon here only offers more RGB, the extra SSD slot and the second gen 5 expansion slot. And that does seem like a tough sell, especially if you don't really care about those extra features. Now, I really think that this motherboard should cost less in order to compete a bit better against the other options on the market, even if it is the cheapest board that offers that second Gen 5 PCIe slot. Now you should wait for VRM performance reviews, but it seems capable enough with the 18 plus one phase setup with 75 amp power stages. So I don't think it will struggle with overclocking, but I would not call it a real hobby board. You do get a postcode, which is nice, uh, but it lacks the physical buttons and some of the other extras that you do want from a proper enthusiast board. So for $70 more, you can get the Aorus Master, which adds physical buttons, which uh, has better VRMs, which has better heat sinks, which has a lot of metal reinforcements everywhere, and a 10 gigabit LAN on top of that as well, which does make this carbon yet again look a bit too expensive. But this is exactly where the MSI Z690 Unify comes in. So this is a $500 board that is aimed at PC enthusiasts and reviewers who change their hardware a lot. And I guess that is the reason that this motherboard was a part of MSI's very fancy reviewers kit this year. It is a massive case with all kinds of goodies inside. So you get this motherboard, a brand new Alder Lake CPU, some DDR5 memory, and their new 360 millimeter all-in-one cooler to match that new 1700 socket. Now, unfortunately, I can only discuss the motherboard today, so the rest will come to light in the next few days. $500 is a lot of money, and most of you will not have to spend anywhere near this much for a motherboard. But compared to the $400 carbon, you do get quite a lot more for those extra hundred dollars. You get physical buttons. It is nicely reinforced with a lot of metal on the front and on the back, which I would say doesn't matter if you just build your PC once, but it is really important if you are constantly, you know, changing your hardware around. And the VRMs are upgraded too. You get 19 plus two phases with 105 amp power stages, plus some voltage readout points as well. So this board is basically in line with the Aorus Master, which is a little bit cheaper, and the ROG Hero from ASUS, which should cost you a lot more. And I would say picking between those three will very much come down to personal brand preference or just maybe based on the looks alone, because MSI is taking a bit of a unique approach here by dropping all the RGB, uh, which a lot of people will appreciate, but it's also not for everyone. If you compare it to the Carbon right here, you get the same uh, five M2 slots, four are Gen 4 and one is Gen 3, and you get the same two Gen 5 PCIe slots. You get the same eight fan headers, two addressable RGB headers, and two internal USB 2.0 headers. But this board has two internal USB 3 headers for cases with four front USB ports. The type C header is now a 20 gigabit one. And while the back IO looks the same with a total of 10 USB ports, Wi-Fi 6E and 2.5 gigabit LAN, some of those USB ports are actually faster. Now, unfortunately, this board still doesn't have a 10 gigabit LAN nor support for Thunderbolt, which I would say would have been nice to see on a motherboard in this price class. 
But if you don't care about those two things, it is a pretty impressive high-end board and definitely a solid option for the upcoming CPUs. Now that is it for today. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions about any of these two motherboards or if you have any questions about the upcoming CPU launch tomorrow. And don't forget to check out my videos on the ASUS and Gigabyte motherboards as well. Now, leave a like if you enjoyed this video. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to never miss an upload. Bye guys and see you in the next one.